Good morning, ladies. How is everyone? Fine. How many of you read Psalm 119? Is there a, ver a verse or a part that you want to holler out that was just amazing? You could give the whole, th what is the theme of Psalm 119? That the word is like, comm his command is everything, right? That the truth is everything. All right, well, let's go ahead and pray. We all need to wake up. Heavenly Father, <laughs> we love you, and we're so happy to be here. I just pray all distractions would be removed. We would be able to focus in what it is, Lord, that you want us to focus in on. Prepare our hearts uh, for worship and the teaching. Um, we just thank you so much that um, you are present here. You're guiding and leading, and I just pray that we would pay attention and that we would be aware of what it is that you need us to think about, to meditate on. I pray um, as we uh, go out into the community today that it would be a ripple effect from what we've learned today, that you would move strongly through us and that um, we would be able to give someone an encouraging word or get them excited about diving into uh, your word and learning about who you are. We love you, Lord, and we just thank you for this opportunity opportunity to be here. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Take a seat. It's nice to have a little bit of caffeine this morning. I tell you, my, my day has already been long. So, Well, good morning, and for those of you that don't know me, my name's Jana, and I'm on um, the lead team, and I hang out with you guys on Tuesday mornings, so. Um, when I was starting to go through this teaching, I was really excited about what God was showing me, and then I got a lot less excited because um, it was very challenging for me, and God really challenged me on some stuff that I need to work on. So I'm going to share that with you today because I think you probably are going to be probably as challenged as I was. So um, we're going to talk about engaging in truth today. But last week, Nicole talked to us about the value and power of God's word. And she challenged us to read through Psalms 119. And as she talked about this, she talked about the Bible being our sword of truth and it's the only offensive weapon that God gives us in our spiritual armor. I so loved how she shared that. Because when I prepare or I find myself in battle, Psalms is often the spot that I go to in my Bible. So how many of you were able to read parts of all of it or some of Psalms 119 this week? Yeah, that's awesome. Way to raise your hand. Hi, Holly. I saw that. Um, and so I really like that because today we're going to talk about engaging in truth. In Psalms 119, every single one of those verses speaks clearly about the benefit of not just reading the Bible, but engaging in the Word of God. So I started looking at what's the definition of engaging actually meaning. So it means to either occupy, attract, or involve someone's interest or attention. And another one was, was, was to establish meaningful contact so that one can move into a position to do something. What's really important when we look at this is engage is a verb, meaning that that takes effort and action on our part. So engaging in truth creates this foundation for us for our lives by help cultivating a close relationship with God. It starts by picking up our Bibles and reading, but then it goes to understanding and then applying his truth through our actions. So here's a question I want us to all think about honestly. What kind of relationship do you personally have with God? Is he a stranger? Is he an acquaintance? Is he a friend? Or is he your best friend and confident? Despite which category you find yourself in this morning, the real question is, is are you actively working on creating a deeper relationship with him? Is that on a deeper level? God desires to have a close, intimate relationship with each and every one of us, and not just be someone that we kind of know or we hang out with on occasion. So why do we need to engage in truth? 
Jesus warns us in John 10.10. 10. He says the thief's purpose is to steal, kill, and destroy. But my purpose is to give them a rich and satisfying life. You see, Satan's target is our mind, and his weapon is lies. So how are we going to combat lies if we don't engage in God's truth? The enemy of our soul wants us to believe that we serve a God of restriction who is distant and hard to understand. And I was driving in my car, and I was listening to Kayla of Christian Radio, and they do these one-minute encouragement spots. And uh, Levi Lesko did this little spot talking about God's commands versus restriction. And I really loved what he had to say. He said, anytime you read God saying, do not, it is equivalent to God saying, do not hurt yourself. Because you see, in John 17, 17, God says that this word is truth, his word. So this is where we need to start. This is when this study has all been about. So when we engage in the Bible, we learn who we are as believers in Christ, what our true identity is. And I love the song that we just sang, saying, I am who you say I am. There's huge power in that and truth in that. Because God gave us a new identity. We're forgiven. We're loved. We're accepted. We're valued. And that's just a couple things, just to name a few. But see, Satan doesn't want us to live our lives with our God-given identity. But the way we combat that is lies are quieted by the resounding truth of God's word. So God gives us commands in the Bible. Sorry, my allergies are killing me today. <clears throat> God gives us commands in the Bible so that we can obey him. And that is for our own good so that we can live in freedom and his protection. And Pastor Kyle discussed this truth in his Sunday teaching just a few weeks ago. And if you didn't get a chance to hear it, I really recommend you watch it online. And it's titled, titled Weightless, and it's in the headline series that we're doing now. And it's really worth listening to. But just to summarize, he talked about how God exercises his authority through his commands. And he does this in order to give life to us, to love us, and to draw us nearer to him. See, his commands are a way of showing us his character. You ever want to know what God's like? That's a good place to start. It starts to teach us who he is. His commands show us that character. But here's the kicker, ladies. Engaging in truth is not just knowing the truth, but obeying it. And the problem is that none of us do that perfectly, ever. <laughs> so you see, we're all broken people. That's why... Every one of us struggle, and sometimes we fail. So sin actually means that we've missed the benchmark of what God's approval is. That's really the definition of that. So see, sin separates us from having a relationship with God. And the cost of our sin is death. That's why we all need Jesus. See, Nicole talked about last week how Jesus experienced everything that we've experienced in this life. But he did it perfectly and without sin. That's why he willingly suffered an agonizing death on a cross, so that he could take our place, because that's where we deserved to be. He paid our debt, and in doing so, we are forgiven, and we get to be in right relationship with Jesus, and we get a cool gift of eternal life as well. So um, in some of the scriptures that I'm listing today, I used a lot of different Bible translations, and I wanted to put some different ones on that maybe um, some of you don't use a lot. Um, but this one is in the New Living Translation, and this is in 1 John 21. And it says, My dear children, I am writing to you so that you will not sin. But if anyone does sin, see, he knew we would. Um, we have an advocate who pleads our case before the Father. He is Christ Jesus, and he is the one who is truly righteous. And I think sometimes we forget that Jesus is our advocate, and he's up there vouching for us, and he will do that before God. So I believe it's important not to skew the purpose of God's commands by viewing them either as restrictive or being on the other end of that is having it be a checkoff list of rules of something that we do outwardly. But instead, we should really look at them and take a close look, look at our heart and our thought life. See, I grew up in a family that loved Jesus, who modeled serving and showing Christ's love to others at home, in our home and at church. But as I grew older and my relationship with Jesus became personal and my own, I began to realize that God's commands are not just about my behavior, 
that the deeper issue of my heart condition, you know, those deep spots that you don't want to share with anyone, that's why God gave us the gift of the Holy Spirit. And um, it's described in a lot of different ways in the Bible, but I love that he's described as our helper, our comforter, our intercessor, our counselor, and our conscience. So I want to, we're going to play a clip here in just a minute, and I think it's a really great analogy of the struggle that we find ourselves in when we know something and we have really good intention versus putting them into action and actually obeying this. So let's take a look real quick. I really felt like Mr. Bean this week. I don't know if any of you have ever felt like that, but I was, it took him a while to get down, and I love that God is patient for us to do that. But I identify with Mr. Bean on several different levels, but growing up, I was a gymnast, and so I decided to do something different in high school, and I decided to join the diving team. And um, our very first practice, my coach said, come up here with me. And we went up on the three-meter springboard, so it's a high dive. And he's like, it's really simple. First thing we're going to learn is to do just a straight back dive. It's super simple. He's like, you know how to stay tight. He's like, all you have to do is just stand tight and squeeze. Keep your arms really tight and keep your arms squeezed. And so your ears are squeezed in tight. All you have to do is just fall back, and you'll have a perfect entry. You'll go right into the water. But if you go limp or you pull your head out, you're going to slap on your belly, and you're going to have a bruise for a month. And I remember just sitting there thinking, and when you look over, has anyone ever done platform diving or even off like a 10 meter? The thing is, even on a high dive, it's not just that three meters. You're seeing the 20 feet down below there. So it's, it's very intimidating. And I remember him just sitting there and calmly saying, if you just do what I say, all you have to do, follow the instruction and just tip back. So all you do need is to fall back. And faith is a lot like that. Um, and faith is being what we're, sh is, Sorry about that. Faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we don't see. So that tipping point is the toughest spot. You know, Mr. Bean, I mean, he still got down, didn't he? That's really the goal. It may not be as pretty, but it's really about the attitude of what we're doing. But that tipping point, and maybe you do need a friend to maybe stomp on your fingers. And I have to say, I've had friends do that, and I'm grateful that they did. Kind of help us along with that. So trusting in the instruction you land safety, just safely every time. And each time with diving, I would get up there and do that. It would get easier and easier. So then my coach would add more difficulty to my dives. And that's what engaging in truth looks a lot like as well. See, God's word is designed to call us towards spiritual maturity and growth. And again, that takes effort and action with God's help. So this is a process called sanctification, and that's a super big churchy word, but it's really important we know what it means. So it's a process of being set apart, and by the Holy Spirit's help, it helps us grow out of our sinful nature and become more like and into the character of Jesus. So even Mr. Bean, with some help, he followed through. So where are you at? Are you sitting up or laying or hanging off the platform? Have you even approached the stairs? When we trust God and put his commands into action, we will never be disappointed. He equips us for that road ahead. And each time we learn valuable lessons along the way to help us in the future. So have you ever been, you know, you open your Bible, you're reading it, and God's just given you such good food, and you're like, yes, I'm loving this. And all of a sudden you read something and you're like, hmm. I don't know if I love this right now. Or it just pierces you with conviction. Or you just get a knee jerk or a twinge. Are there parts of his word that you'd rather not focus on? So here's just an example that um, God has been really working on me. Um, and this is in Matthew 6, and I didn't have it up on the screen today. And I am going to read it to you in the amplified version. And I really like that one if you haven't. Um, spend some time in it. It's very wordy. I think if it was actually printed out in a Bible, it would be like a wheelbarrow. But it's very descriptive. And this is talking about forgiveness. I know this verse. But, you know, sometimes when you read that, God just shows you stuff that you need to work on. And I really like this one. So um, it's Matthew six fourteen, And it says, For if you give others their trespasses, which meaning their reckless and willful sins, 
your heavenly Father will forgive you also. Okay, that's good. But if you do not forgive others, meaning you nurture in your heart anger with the result that interferes with your relationship with God, then your Father will not forgive your trespasses. That stung. So I had to ask myself, what am I going to do with that truth? So I call these heart checks, and they're really the questions that I ask myself, am I actually doing what God asked me? Am I walking in obedience? So I believe that's what engaging in truth is all about. So here's a challenge, and this was my challenge, and I'm going to share it with you so we can work on our stuff together, because believe me, ladies, I do not have it all together. (laughs) Um, So take out your pen. This is a question I want you to really think about and pray about this week. It's about those areas in our lives that the Holy Spirit has shown us that we need to work on. The ones we want to ignore, skip over, work on later, or flat out refuse to even look at it. So what areas can you identify in your life? Is there anything that the Holy Spirit has told you that you need to work on? Why do you resist it? So really it's the why behind that. Just spend some time chewing on that. It's been a tough spot for me this week. And I think it's so important that we engage in truth because it's easy to fall prey to what society and our culture and even our own sinful nature wants to say truth is. Um, I was listening to a Focus on the Family podcast and they were talking about um, surveys that they do every year. And they were talking about how statistics every year show that Christian beliefs are becoming more liberal on what is morally acceptable. How can that be? This doesn't change. Or another um, example, I was watching a TV show and there was a guy and a girl talking and the guy was talking, oh, I didn't know you had a son to the lady. And they were having a discussion and she said, you know, I think it's really important that my son finds his own truth. And the guy celebrated that. Yeah, that's good. Why is it in our society that, oh, yeah, your truth is fine, and that's your truth and my truth, and we all think that's real great? Or it may look like something like, I can still love God, but I'm just going to add my own rules, which are much more consistent to my experience, or maybe it's more comfortable to help me justify my own actions. See, all of this is a very slippery slope. Remember, commands represent God's authority to give us life so that we can live fully, to the fullest. That's what he desires for each one of us. So when we intentionally reject God's commands, that is the beginning of rejecting his authority as creator of the universe. He's a pretty powerful guy. So as you read through the Bible, you'll discover that that is one of the most largest themes in God's word. So here's the truth, ladies. When we reject God's authority, we lose the ability to have life to the fullest. So let's open our Bibles um, to Matthew 7. It is the first book of the New Testament. And Matthew was one of Jesus' disciples. Um, And before he was a disciple, he was one of the most hated guys around because it was like he worked for the IRS. He was a crooked tax collector. But he wrote Matthew kind of like a CPA would, very detailed. And um, so we're going to go to chapter 7. But chapters 5, 6, and 7 actually record the longest teaching that Jesus ever gave. And massive crowds were following him. So he just decided to go up on the mountainside and sit and begin to teach people truth. So this is also known as the Sermon on the Mount. And one of the methods that Jesus used to communicate his messages was through parables. So parables are basically an earthly story. So people could all relate and understand it was a part of their daily life. But it had a heavenly and spiritual meaning. So those who were willing to hear the truth would understand them. So this is the parable about building a solid foundation. And I used the voice for this translation. So in verse 24, it says, Those people who are listening to me, those people who hear what I say and live according to my teachings, you are like a wise man who built his house on a rock, on a firm foundation. When the storms hit, rain pounded down and waters rose, Levees broke and winds beat all the walls of that house, but the house did not fall because it was built upon the rock. Those of you who are listening and do not hear are like a fool who builds house on sand. When a storm comes to his house, what will happen? 
The rain will fall, the waters will rise, the wind will blow, and his house will collapse with a great crash. You know, not only does our culture and society twist truth, but the enemy can and will use our life circumstances to warp the promises of God. And I don't know if you've experienced this, because I know I have, where in one instant, just the reality that you knew was gone forever. Anyone identify with that? Yeah. So those life storms, they can rage. It may be something like being a victim, swept up in the consequences of someone else's sin. It may be being rejected by someone you love. Maybe it's the death of someone you love. Or maybe it's helplessly watching your child suffer with a chronic condition that you can't fix. Those are all things that have become a part of my reality. And it's a reality and part of my story I never assumed I'd have. And I'm a real visual learner. So I found a few pictures to depict depict what some storms in my life have looked like. Yeah. I love the beach view. Isn't it great? When life looks like that, it's perfect. It's tranquil. It's really comfortable. I want to be sitting there right now. It looks great. But all of a sudden, the view from your porch can just change. And it, go, it can go from serene to beautiful, and then it switches to destruction and complete chaos. So your storms may look really different than mine. But no matter the cause, I believe we all have felt extreme heartache, which has a way of distorting how we perceive truth, especially if we don't routinely engage in the word of God. So you may be very familiar with the parable of the two builders. It's one of the earliest Bible stories I can remember as a child. I remember Bible stories in um, felt boards all my characters, and I think of the song, you know, the wise man built his house upon the rock. But as I read it this time, God gave me a fresh perspective about these two builders. I always assumed that the foolish builder never really had the intent of building his life on truth. But when you think about it, there are many similarities between the wise man and the foolish man. So here's a picture of two houses. See, both of them did the work to build their houses. They both persevered and they finished their homes. And to some extent, really, these houses look pretty much the same from the outside. The foundation of their home, however, in which they have invested all of their time, their effort, and their expense is hidden. The real foundation of our life is usually hidden and is only proven in the storms of life. So really, where did the foolish man go wrong? It was not in deliberately seeking a bad foundation, but in taking no thought in his foundation. His fault was not an error in judgment, but neglecting to look at his foundation. Have you ever found yourself there? I know I have. So I love this next picture, because a picture can be worth a thousand words. And it was very interesting. This was actually in Florida a couple of year ago, uh, years ago. One of the hurricanes came through. And this man is standing out there, and he's just feeling awful because all of his neighbor's houses, I mean, look at that neighborhood. It's just sheer destruction. So they kept asking him, uh, why is your house still standing? And he said, well, when I moved down here, I went to an engineer, and I told him, I want to build a house that can withstand any hurricane. The engineer said, Okay. So they started coming up with these great designs, and um, the engineer would say, "Uh, why do you want to put a window there? I thought you wanted a house that would withstand a hurricane. He's like, no window. Okay, well, put it there. Well, I'm going to put a balcony around the side, and the engineer would say, yeah, but I thought you wanted a house that would withstand a hurricane. And he said that really the code down in Florida is that you only need to build a house that's engineered up to withstand winds of 120 miles an hour. He's like, my house can withstand 250. And he said those pillars go down 40 feet into bedrock and sheer concrete and rebar all the way up this hop. He didn't even put pretty siding on the side. He wanted MDF so nothing would blow off. 
I think this is a really perfect example when we look at that of a house or someone that is really actively engaging a good foundation. Of building their life on the truth of God's word. His health was his house withstood the storm. Or his neighbor sure didn't. I think the guy behind him was just lucky because he just happened to have his house there. It's, if you look back in verse 24 of this parable, Jesus makes a really important distinction between people. And I think sometimes we all, a lot of us know this story, but forget this part. It says, those people who are listening to me, those people who hear what I say and live according to my teachings, you are like a wise man who built his house on the rock, that firm foundation. You see, merely hearing God's word isn't enough to provide a secure foundation. It's necessary that we are also doers of his word. And Jesus is also warning us here that the foundations of our lives are going to be shaken at some point in time. And I know I've bought into the lie where I'm like, that, you know, all of a sudden when life just sucks you sideways, and I hear myself saying, um, this doesn't happen to me. This happens to other people. Like, why did I think I was so special? Storms are going to hit, ladies, and probably more than one. So doesn't it sound better if we start to fortify our foundations now instead of later? So let's all really look at this question. Again, are there areas, are there any dark spots that are just hidden in your heart? Where you're refusing to, or you just want to ignore what God is commanding you to do? And tonight I want to close with James 125. It's not tonight. It's in the morning. Oh my gosh, I need more coffee. It already feels late. I've been up for a really long time. <laughs> and James 125, and I did this in the Passion Translation. It's kind of my new favorite, something fun to read that Nicole shared with us last week. And it says, but those who set their gaze deeply into the perfecting law of liberty are fascinated by and respond to the truth they hear and are strengthened by it. They experience God's blessing in all that they do. Man, I want to be like that. I want to be strengthened. I want to be fascinated by the truth that God gives me, not knee-jerk and fight him about it, but be stepping towards that, to be able to walk up that platform and just dive right off, knowing that God's foundation is worth doing. And I have to tell you, with the storms that have hit my life, if I hadn't had my feet securely, I think, strapped down, I felt like I was needed tied, and I think I lost some paint off a lot of my walls. My foundation is still there, and I wouldn't be standing here today if it wasn't for the truth of God. So how are you going to respond to the truth that God wants you to hear? Ladies, when we make the choice to just step out in faith, that tipping point where we just fall back and do what God commands us to do, we will never be disappointed. Let's pray. God, I thank you so much for these women, Lord, and I thank you so much for LifePoint women. God, I just pray that we would all want to be strengthened by each word and each time when we pick up our Bibles, God, that you just give us a heart to just seek that and give us a heart above all things to love others and love you more than anything. Help us to be mindful in building a strong foundation based on your truth. Please bless our discussion time today. In Jesus' name, amen.